This cult leader was sentenced to life in prison after his shocking crimes left seven people dead. At first glance, the Manson family looked like a harmless cult that just wanted to have fun, but that would prove to be otherwise as the crimes they carried out over a two-day span would make headlines all over the country and remain the subject of numerous books, TV series, and movies. This is the story of the Tate LaBianca murders. On November 12, 1934, in Cincinnati, Ohio, Charles Manson was born to his teenage mother, Kathleen Maddox, and his alleged father, Colonel Scott. Charles's parents weren't married, but when he was around two years old, Colonel was ordered to pay $5 every month in child support to Kathleen, and because of that, he is presumed to be Charles's father, but Charles has never met his biological father before, and the details surrounding all of this aren't really clear, so we can't say anything for certain. What we can say is that Charles had a very rough childhood. His mother Kathleen ran away from home when she was only 15 years old, the same age she gave birth to Charles. So to make ends meet, she resorted to prostitution. Kathleen was a heavy drinker, and when it came to getting in trouble with the law, she wasn't any stranger to that either. When Charles was a four-year-old boy, Kathleen robbed a gas station with her older brother, Luther, and she was sentenced to five years in prison, while Luther was given ten years. Because of that, Charles's mother wasn't very present in his life, and he always found himself moving from home to home to be taken care of by his relatives, like his grandparents. Even after Kathleen was released on parole after serving three years, she still drank heavily, and she and Charles were always moving to boarding houses and shoddy hotels because she couldn't afford rent. Kathleen's situation was so dire that she tried placing Charles in foster care temporarily as she found it too difficult to raise him, but that couldn't be approved, so instead, a court ordered Charles to attend a reform school called Gibalt School for Boys as he was known to be a troublemaker. Starting from the age of nine, Charles found himself in trouble with the law numerous times for offences such as arson, theft, and truancy, so he was sent to Gibalt with the goal of being disciplined. But if anything, that made him even more of a troublemaker than before because of how strict the school was. Back in those days, teachers used to hit misbehaving students with items such as rattan canes, leather straps, and wooden panels, and Gibalt was no different. But since it was a reform school, students like Charles would be beaten for the most minor rule violations, and because of that, Charles hated the school. Charles was sent to Gibalt when he was around 12 or 13, but he barely spent any time there because he kept running away from school and robbing stores, so he was sent to a different school, but the same pattern repeated. He kept running away from school and robbing even more stores, and he even stole someone's car with another boy that was around his age, so he was sent to another school, but the same pattern kept repeating itself. More running away, more robbing, more stealing, more everything. I could go on and on and on about this, but I'm gonna stop right there. Simply put, Charles spent pretty much all of his teenage years in various correctional facilities and institutions, and he would continue his life of crime into adulthood. By the time he was 32, in 1967, he had been incarcerated for more than half of his life. In 1967, Charles moved to San Francisco, California, and that is where he established a cult known as the Manson Family. One day, when Charles was walking through Berkeley, California, he stumbled across a librarian named Mary Bruner, whom he instantly fell in love with, and it wouldn't be long until they were living with each other in Mary's apartment. She would become the first member of the Manson family. Around a month after meeting Mary, Charles stumbled across another woman in Venice, California, named Lynette Fromm, whom he also fell in love with, and it wouldn't be long until she moved inside the apartment with Charles and Mary. Lynette would become the second member of the Manson family. Shortly afterwards, Charles, Mary, and Lynette moved to a house in a district in San Francisco called Haight-Ashbury. To understand why these two women decided to join Charles's cult, you need to understand what was going on in their lives and what was going on in Haight-Ashbury at the time. 
When summer had begun in 1967, Hayes Ashbury was going through this social phenomenon known as the Summer of Love. Around 100,000 people, most of whom were young adults, came together in Hayes Ashbury to embrace the hippie culture, free love, anti-war, and psychedelic drugs. The whole point of this movement was to promote peace, as this was going on during the Vietnam War, to accept alternative lifestyles, to accept diversity, to accept communal living, as it carried this bad stigma at the time, and to give people the freedom they deserved, amongst many other things. Mary was one of those people that was looking for that freedom. She wanted to escape from the rat race. Mary was 23 years old, and she was tired of going to work, returning home, doing some shopping, going to bed, going to work, returning home, doing some shopping, and repeating this boring cycle every day for almost the entire week. So she quit her job and joined the Manson family. Although Mary had a relatively stable background before she joined the Manson family, the same couldn't be said about Lynette. When Lynette was a teenager, she became addicted to drugs and alcohol, and that subsequently affected her grades in school. But nevertheless, she graduated from high school and went to college. Lynette didn't graduate from college, however. In 1967, when she was 19, she dropped out after getting into an argument with her parents one day. They kicked her out of the house and she became homeless. Lynette was sitting on a curb when Charles suddenly left his bus and stumbled across her. The two of them quickly headed off and because of the situation that Lynette was in, she was homeless, she didn't have any money, she felt that joining the Manson family was the right move. In the Hayes Ashbury house, the Manson family would consume drugs and have free sex, and Charles would travel around California and recruit more followers in a similar way. By targeting those who were emotionally, mentally, or even financially unstable, and were looking for a place to call home, and with all the drugs and free sex that was going on in the Hayes Ashbury house, runaways began flocking there like sheep. The exact number of followers in the Manson family isn't entirely clear, as they were free to come and go, but at its peak, it was believed to be around 100 people, with less than a dozen of them being core followers. You'll know what I mean by that later in the video but basically, these were the followers that took part in the murders. The followers consisted of both men and women, but they were mostly women, as Charles would have sexual relationships with them. As the Manson family grew in size, they found themselves moving from house to house, but during mid-1968, they temporarily settled in a three-acre estate in Los Angeles, California with a man named Dennis Wilson. Dennis was a drummer and singer for a rock band called the Beach Boys, and the reason the Manson family were able to live in Dennis's house was because Dennis had stumbled across two of their followers. Dennis recently went through this really messy divorce with his wife, but since he was now a free man, he regularly drove around Los Angeles to pick up female hitchhikers so he could bring them to his home and have drugs and sex with them. One day, Dennis picked up a couple of hitchhikers named Patricia Krenwinkle and Ella Bailey, both of whom were parts of the Manson family. That same evening, Dennis had to go to the studio to record a music session, but he was nice enough to allow Patricia and Ella to stay in his home while he was away. Not a very smart thing to do. At around 3 a.m., Dennis had finished his music session and returned home. But when he entered his home, he saw something in front of him that he could have never expected. There was one man, Charles Manson, and around 20 or so young, beautiful women in skimpy clothing inside his living room. What Dennis didn't know at the time was that he unintentionally opened his doors for the Manson family. But since he loved drugs and free sex like the Manson family, they were all welcomed inside. This was especially good news for Charles because he was an aspiring musician. He primarily made folk music and with Dennis being a musician himself, he had all the connections in the music industry that Charles was looking for. Charles and Dennis got along really well with each other. They were having music sessions, they were partying. 
aka having drugs and sex with the members of the Manson family, and the girls were cleaning Dennis's house and cooking for him with the intention of building a relationship so they could one, stay in his house, and two, get Charles access to Dennis's contacts. And it kind of worked, because Dennis soon introduced Charles to a man named Terry Melcher. Terry was a very successful music producer who worked with famous bands like Paul Revere and the Raiders and the Birds. And if there was anyone that could get Charles into the music industry and turn him into the superstar that he was looking to be, it was Terry. After meeting Charles, Terry got Dennis to record more music sessions with Charles at the studio, but after Terry heard them, he wasn't impressed because Charles's music sucked. He didn't have any musical talent or what it took to go mainstream in the music industry. Not only that, but Charles and his followers became very rowdy and they turned Dennis's life into a living hell. They started asking him for money so they could buy more drugs, they started stealing his belongings like his clothes and other household items, and they even crashed his $21,000 Ferrari that was uninsured into a mountain. There was even this huge gonorrhea outbreak from all the sex parties they were having, and poor Dennis had to pay for everyone's penicillin injections. In total, Dennis lost around $100,000 off his belongings or his money to the Manson family, but instead of dealing with the mess himself, he moved to a small flat and waited for the Manson family to get evicted. When the Manson family were evicted, they moved to a 55-acre ranch in Los Angeles, California called Spawn Ranch. Spawn Ranch used to be used as a movie set and even a dairy farm at some point, but now it's being used as the headquarters for the Manson family. With Dennis and Charles's relationship turning sour and Charles's music not being good itself, Terry didn't have any reason to push his music any further or give him the record deal he was looking for, and that made Charles have a lot of resentment towards him. Terry lived in a luxury home at 10050 Cielo Drive in Benedict Canyon, Los Angeles, and Charles had visited his house many times before, not just because of Terry, but because the estate's owner was a man named Rudy Altobelli. Rudy was a talent manager that worked in both the film and music industries. He worked with movie stars like Henry Fonda and Catherine Hepburn, both of whom had won Academy Awards. So if Terry couldn't get Charles into the music industry, Charles was hoping Rudy could. Rudy did meet Charles at a party in Dennis's house before Dennis moved out, and Dennis did listen to Charles's tapes, but just like Terry, he wasn't impressed, and he just brushed them aside. Charles's dreams of signing a record deal were shattered, and that would become the catalyst of a series of tragic events that were yet to unfold. If you want to see more videos like this, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. In January 1969, Terry left 10050 Cielo Drive and moved inside his mother's home in Malibu, California, and the following month, Rudy leased his vacant estate to a woman named Sharon Tate and her husband, Roman Polanski. Sharon was a very talented model and actress who was rising to fame in the 1960s after starring in movies such as The Fairness Vampire Killers and Valley of the Dolls, and for the latter, she was nominated for a Golden Globe Award. When Sharon was a teenager, she won several beauty pageants and subsequently pursued a career as a model. When she was in high school, she earned the titles of both Homecoming Queen and prom queen, and that opened her doors for the film industry, where she started off as an extra for a few different films, and then gradually went on to play bigger roles. When Sharon was filming The Fearless Vampire Killers, she met Roman, the film director, and the two of them ended up getting married the following year in 1968. By mid-1969, the Manson family were already fully invested in crime. They were primarily making their money from selling stolen car parts parts after stealing people's cars and from selling drugs like marijuana, LSD, and cocaine. As bad as these crimes were, they weren't anywhere near as bad as to what they did 
on July 25, 1969. On July 25, 1969, Charles ordered Mary and a couple of other Manson family members, a woman named Susan Atkins and a man named Bobby Beausoleil, to go to the house of a man named Gary Hinman and pay him a visit. Gary had met the Manson family before because at some point he allowed several of their followers to live in his house. If you recall, before the Manson family settled in Spawn Ranch, they kept moving from house to house to find a place to live for their growing cult, and one of the houses they temporarily stayed in was Gary's house. People that personally knew Gary described him as a very kind, gentle, caring guy, and he was because he allowed people that he hadn't met before to stay in his home if they didn't have any place to stay. So his home was basically a crash pad that accommodated almost anyone who needed temporary housing. And in this case, that was those Manson family followers. Despite how kind and caring Gary seemed, he was allegedly living a double life. And I'll explain the allegedly parse in a moment. Gary was a drug dealer that sold a psychedelic drug called mescaline. And one of the people he sold it to was Bobby. Bobby purchased around $1,000 of mescaline from Gary. But the only problem was the mescaline was bad. So those few Manson family members went to Gary's house to get a refund. It's not entirely clear what happened next. But from what I could gather, Gary refused to give the money back and that's when the Manson family decided to take matters into their own hands. They kept Gary hostage in his own home for three days and during those three days, Charles and another Manson family member, a man named Bruce Davis, went to Gary's home so Charles could start making his demands. Gary allegedly had thousands of dollars in assets, so his house, cars, stocks, bonds, etc. And Charles demanded that he join the Manson family so his money and assets would be turned over. But Gary obviously refused. That didn't end well for Gary because during those three days, the Manson family tied him up and violently assaulted him. Charles cut his ear off using a samurai sword. Bobby viciously beat him. Susan, Mary and Bobby took turns smothering his face with a pillow and Susan and Mary stitched his wounds up using dental floss. To end it all, Bobby stabbed Gary in his chest using a knife and then he wrote the words political piggy on his wall using his blood to make it seem like the Black Panthers, a former political party, had carried out the murders. The Manson family then stole Gary's cars and they left him to die in his own house. Gary was 34 years old. A few days later, Gary's friends started getting worried because they hadn't heard anything from him for the past few days. So they went to his home and they noticed his mailbox was completely full and his windows were covered with flies. So they all decided to break inside the home and that's when they discovered Gary's dead body rotting away and they immediately phoned the police. The police soon arrived and an investigation was immediately underway. A few days later, Bobby was driving to San Francisco in Gary's car when a police officer suddenly noticed the car as it was reported stolen, so he pulled Bobby over and proceeded to question him. Bobby told the officer that he recently bought the car from the previous owner, who was this black man, but the officer knew Gary was white, so that was enough for him to have Bobby's fingerprints taken. And when the results were back, they were an exact match to the fingerprints found in Gary's house. So Bobby was arrested, but the rest of the followers were free to roam the streets. For now at least. Coming back to the whole allegedly thing I was on about, I said allegedly because the details on this are kind of wishy-washy. We don't really know if the Manson family's motive for killing Gary was money or was it something else. And we don't know if Gary was actually a drug dealer like the Manson family claimed. All of this is kind of up in the air. But what we do know was this was the Manson family's first murder 
and they weren't stopping anytime soon. On August 8th, 1969, Charles ordered one of his followers, a man named Tex Watson, to drive to 10050 Cielo Drive with Susan, Patricia, and another follower, a woman named Linda Kasabian, to kill everyone that lived inside the estate as gruesomely as possible, simply because Terry used to live there. The followers were armed with several knives, and Tex, the leader of the group, had a handgun, and after they arrived at the estate, the first thing Tex did was climb up a telephone pole and cut the phone lines, so that way, no one would be able to phone the police. 10050 Cielo Drive had this gate that was 6 feet tall and 12 feet wide, so the followers scaled the right side of the fence where this embankment was, and from there, they headed down to the estate's driveway. On the driveway inside his car was an 18-year-old boy named Stephen Parent. Stephen was at the estate because he was visiting a man named William Garretson, who was the estate's caretaker, and William lived inside the estate's guest house. So there was the main house where Sharon lived, and there was the smaller guest house for William. Stephen was there to see William because he had this radio that he wanted to show him, but William didn't seem to be that interested, so Stephen went back inside his car, and as he was about to reverse out of the driveway, Tex suddenly approached the driver's side door with the window already rolled down, and he slashed William's hand with a knife as he was trying to protect himself, and he fired several shots at him with his handgun until it was clear that he was dead. Tex, Susan, and Patricia then broke inside the main house to continue their murder spree while Linda waited by the gate to be a lookout, just in case someone passed by and noticed what they were doing. Inside the main house was Sharon and the three guests that she had invited over, her friend Abigail Folger, Abigail's boyfriend Wojtek Frakowski, and Sharon's ex-boyfriend Jay Sebring, whom she dated before she met Roman, but they remained good friends with each other. A few hours ago, Sharon and her friends went to a restaurant to have dinner, and when they were finished, they all returned to Sharon's house at approximately 10.30pm. Roman would have been with them as well, but luckily for for him, he was in London working on a film, and that decision ended up saving his own life. By the time the Manson family broke inside, it was already past midnight, and everyone was in bed getting ready to sleep, or in Wojtek's case, already asleep on the living room sofa. The Manson family woke Wojtek up, and Tex kicked him in the head, and demanded that he hand his money over, which he did. He gave them his wallet, but there wasn't much money inside. The Manson family tied Wojtek's hands together using nylon tape, and then they went inside the two bedrooms, where Abigail was by herself, and Sharon and Jay were together, and they were all sitting on their beds, getting ready to go to sleep. The Manson family ordered Sharon and her friends to follow them, and not ask them any questions, and with no other choice, they all obliged, and were led to the living room where Wojtek was. Tex then began tying them all up, and they all started screaming, and Jay screamed at Tex that Sharon was pregnant, and to be careful with her, but Tex had enough with everyone screaming, so he raised his handgun, shot Jay in the armpit, and he collapsed to the ground. Tex then started demanding Sharon and her friends to hand their money over, and they did, but the only money they had was the money in their purses and wallets, and that did not turn out to be a lot of money. Jay tried crawling away from the Manson family, but within seconds, Tex pounced on him and repeatedly stabbed his back with a knife, and Jay tried fighting back, but he was pretty much defenseless, and Tex completely overpowered and killed him. Jay was 35 years old. While all that struggle was going on, Wojtek managed to get his hands free, but instead of trying to run away, he pounced on Susan, knocked her to the ground, and tried wrestling her knife away. Susan fought back and repeatedly stabbed Wojtek, and they were knocking down everything that got in their way. Books, flowers, candles, you name it and Wojtek put up a much bigger fight than Jay. Tex then fired a couple of rounds into Wojtek as he tried escaping through the front door with Susan clinging to him, but Tex finished the job by pouncing on him as well and viciously beating his head with the handgun and repeatedly stabbing him with his knife until it was clear that he was dead. 
Wojtek was 32 years old. While that struggle ensued, Abigail managed to free herself from her restraints and she tried running away, but Patricia got a hold of her and she tried to wrestle Abigail to the ground, but Abigail was much stronger and she got the better of their struggle. Tex noticed what was going on, so he ran towards Abigail and repeatedly stabbed her and she tried running away, but Patricia grabbed onto her again and repeatedly stabbed her as well until it was clear that she was dead like the other victims. Abigail was 25 years old. There was blood all over the floor and walls of the living room and Sharon was the last victim alive. She begged the Manson family not to kill her and told them she was pregnant, but they could care less. And under Tex's command, both Tex and Susan repeatedly stabbed Sharon with their knives until it was clear that she was dead. Sharon was 26 years old. Susan then wrote the word pig on the front door using Sharon's blood and the Manson family headed back to the car where Linda was waiting and they fled the scene. Several hours later, a woman named Winifred Chapman, who was the estate's housekeeper, went to the estate, as she normally would, to collect the newspaper from the mailbox but she suddenly noticed the communication wires hanging across the front gate. Winifred also saw Sharon's friend's cars still in the driveway and she was wondering what was going on, so she decided to go inside the house to investigate. As she walked inside the living room, she stumbled across the dead bodies, so she ran outside and immediately phoned the police. The police soon arrived and an investigation was immediately underway. These murders would be known as the Tate murders, named after Sharon Tate, but the Manson family weren't done just yet. They had something special planned for tomorrow, and it certainly wasn't anything good. On August 9th, the same day the Tate murders occurred, but at night again, the four followers that carried out the Tate murders, along with Charles himself and two other followers, a man named Clem Grogan and a woman named Leslie Van Housen, drove to a luxury home at 3301 Waverly Drive in Las Feliz, Los Angeles to continue their killing spree. The first estate was chosen because Terry used to live there, but Charles chose the second estate likely because it was right beside a house that the Manson family had partied in around a year prior. This time, Linda drove everyone to the address, and just like last time, they were all armed. The estate was owned by a grocery store owner named Leno LaBianca and his wife Rosemary LaBianca, who owned a women's clothing store, and breaking inside their home was a lot easier than Sharon's home, because the only thing the Manson family had to do was climb a small wall and open the back door, as it was left unlocked. Leno was fast asleep on the living room sofa, as it was already past midnight, so the Manson family woke him up and told him to listen to them and to not ask them any questions, and they proceeded to tie him up just like the Tate murder victims. Rosemary was inside her bedroom getting ready to go to sleep when Charles suddenly stormed inside, brought her to the living room, and tied her up next to Leno. Charles told Leno and Rosemary that they weren't going to hurt them, and he went back to the car with Linda, Susan, and Clem, and they drove off leaving the rest of the followers inside the house with Leno and Rosemary. Patricia and Leslie brought Rosemary back to the bedroom, where they placed a pillowcase over her head, and Tex also came inside and wrapped a lamp cord around her neck and mouth. Tex then returned to the living room where Leno was, and he did the exact same to him as he did to his wife. He placed a pillowcase over his head and ramped another lamp cord around his neck and mouth. He then took out a knife and repeatedly stabbed Leno in the throat and abdomen and Rosemary could hear him from the bedroom making these nasty guttural sounds and she was screaming at the Manson family not to touch her husband. But they obviously ignored her and Leno unfortunately bled to death. He was 44 years old. Patricia then took out a knife and stabbed Rosemary, but she ended up hitting her collarbone and breaking the knife, so Rosemary used that opportunity to try and fight back. Leslie and Patricia tried restraining her, but she was too strong, 
so of course Tex, of all the followers, stormed inside the bedroom and helped the two women. Rosemary was in the corner of the bedroom with the pillowcase over her head and while she was all tied up, she blindly swung that lamp around trying to use this as a weapon to defend herself, but Tex wasn't phased and he just pounced on her and repeatedly stabbed her with the knife while Leslie and Patricia were holding her down. Rosemary was screaming and kicking and doing everything she could to defend herself, but she was completely outnumbered and she unfortunately died the same way her husband did, by bleeding to death. Rosemary was 39 years old. Patricia then stabbed Leno in the stomach with her knife and carved the word war into his flesh while the rest of the followers ate some food inside the refrigerator. After all was said and done, the Manson family left the estate and returned to Spawn Ranch by hitchhiking as the other followers had taken their car. These murders would be known as the La Bianca murders and together with the Tate murders, they would be known as the Tate La Bianca murders, which is one of the most infamous murder cases ever in US history and perhaps the most infamous cult murder case ever. Shortly after the La Bianca murders occurred, Leno's stepson, Frank Struthers, was walking back home when he suddenly noticed that Leno's speedboat was still attached to its trailer and the lights inside his house were left on while the curtains were closed, both of which were very abnormal. Frank knew his stepfather never left his speedboat outside at night, so he went to the front door, gave it a knock, but no one answered. Frank then went to a nearby telephone and rang his stepfather, but no one picked up. So he rang his sister instead and explained to her what was going on. The speedboat was left outside, the lights were left on, and he was afraid to go inside. So Frank's sister and her boyfriend joined him at the house and they all walked inside together. As they entered the living room, they found Leno's dead body on the ground. So instead of continuing to search the house, they all ran outside and immediately phoned the police. An investigation was immediately underway and fast forward one month, a $25,000 reward was set up by Roman and a few other contributors for anyone who had any information about the killers of the Tate victims. For some reason, the authorities didn't make the connection that the Gary Hinman and Tate LaBianca murders were related until around two to three months after they occurred, but once they made that connection, their investigation led them to Spawn Ranch, where the Manson family lived, and all the followers that took part in the murders, or had something to do with the murders, were arrested and subsequently taken to trial. Charles, Patricia, Susan, Leslie, and Tex were given life sentences for their roles in the Tate LaBianca murders, Bobby was given a life sentence for the murder of Gary Hinman, and Clem and another follower, Bruce Davis, whom I mentioned earlier, were both given life sentences for a different murder they committed around two weeks after the Tate LaBianca murders. The only core follower that didn't face any charges or spend time in prison was Linda, as she was granted immunity in exchange for her testimony against the rest of the Manson family during the trial, which ended up playing a crucial role in getting them convicted. All of the followers are either dead or still in prison, except for Leslie, who was released on parole very recently in July 2023 after spending 53 years behind bars, and she is currently 74 years old. Thank you for watching today's video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like, comment down below what you want to see next, and subscribe. Until then, see you next time.